take the mastery that you've learned, the wisdom you've learned, and then plant it in a new pot. For me, I did that at Airbnb. I repotted myself from being CEO of a boutique hotel company to being the CEO whisperer, <laughs> helping a tech company with a hospitality focus become more successful because they were successful when I joined. They were just small. That is an interesting model, is for us to say, how do we match young, brilliant entrepreneurs with older, experienced leaders who can actually learn from each other? And I think mutual mentorship, where the young are teaching the old, the old are teaching the young, depending upon the subject, and it's a reciprocal kind of arrangement, is the future of learning and development in most companies. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick Podcast with me, Michael Tingsan. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that builds employees and customers to love and support. Thanks to BizSimply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. We join forces to celebrate the reopening of society and the industry. As an industry, we need to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. This is a very special episode for me and the show. Not only is it our number 100 anniversary episode, but it's also a conversation with one of my business and leadership heroes, Chip Conley. Chip is a true maverick that believes in building businesses that's not only achieving great results, but also make a significant impact on people, community, and the planet. He's a New York Times best-selling author with five books, a top-rated TED speaker, and he has disrupted the hospitality industry not only once, but twice, with his boutique hotel empire, Jos de Vira, and more recently, he helped Airbnb's founder turn their fast-growing tech startup into a global hospitality brand. Chip is also the founder of the Modern Elder Academy, where he gives you a roadmap for midlife and is offered at a beautiful oceanfront campus in Mexico. We start the conversation talking about leaving old identities and mindsets behind and how to feel good about this. Chip shares his own experience of stepping away from the founder and CEO role he had inhabited for many years and how he dealt with leaving that identity behind when he joined Airbnb. Chip shares his views on meaning and despair and how these are connected and how to use them both in the times we're going through right now to make yourself smarter and wiser. Chip also gives his view on the future of hospitality looks like and he introduces us to some new work and life trends to be aware of. The remote worker and nomads, co-living and the importance of doubling down on your loyal customers. Along the way, we visit many other themes, joy, happiness, and how to apply these to life, the importance of knowing when to stop and quit, and let new opportunities come into your life, the importance of failure in achieving success, and the connection you may not have spotted between cash flow and organizational culture. Before you tune in, please sign up to our weekly newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Pack more Maverick insights, strategies, and tools. Now, grab notebook, pen, and coffee, and let's get started. I'm super excited and also very grateful about today's conversation because it's with Chip Conley. And uh, he is a, a maverick that believes in building business, not only that achieves great business results, but also make a significant positive impact on uh, your people, the community you're part of, and our planet. And the first time I heard about Chip when was I read a quote of his. And uh, it really resonated with me. And it said, we're all human. It's the most important neglected fact in business. And at that time, when I heard that, I was in a situation where I felt we needed to be a bit more human in the business I was involved in. But he's also disrupted his hospitality a number of times, actually twice. Uh, and he has done that with his boutique hotel empire and also with helping the Airbnb founders creating a high growth company and work very closely with CEO Brian Chesky. He's also a New York best-selling author with uh, five books all in all, and we will come back to that later in the conversation. He is now the founder of the Modern Elden Academy, 
where he has created, a, I'll call it a roadmap, maybe a way of finding out what do you do with that difficult period in life sometimes for people. And uh, he's a well-known TED speaker as well. Um, and uh, he has also, which I found very incredible when I prepared for this, died nine times. And we, we have to hear that story. And I think he's also hungry for growth and learning. Even at an age at 58, he started learning Spanish and surfing. So welcome to the, the show, Chip. Uh, I hope I haven't butchered your <laughs> your background too much. Uh, no, you know, I, my, it, it, I, well, I'm now 60. I, you're right. That I, I, start, I started Spanish and surfing at 58, but uh, I'm coming to you at age 60 from Baja, California, Sur in, uh, in Mexico. So good to be with you, Michael. Yeah, and it's been your birthday recently, hasn't it? I think I saw you posted something. A few months ago on Halloween, yes. Yeah, yeah. congratulations with that, Chip. Thank and you. also, before we get into it, I just want to thank uh, Larry Corman, who actually uh, connected us uh, way back uh, and made this conversation happen. Uh, and I already mentioned a bit that you have, uh, a, a, maybe some people call it a soft, I call it the right approach to business. You believe that people becomes before profit but profit needs to happen to to make things but one of the things i wanted to start with is a bit of a different place because i was watching linkedin and i saw you had this movie and you were doing something with name tags and identities and i thought that was quite refreshing and then suddenly during that thing you we, we have to cut off because suddenly you, you're just putting fire to these name tags and suddenly the fire evolves a bit but the interesting thing besides that uh, accident, uh, and it was a good laugh, was actually it was a very important message you're sending, especially in these time of uncertainties. Why is it that uh, you are very, uh, you know, I, would, I wouldn't use the, really the wrong word is obsessed, but you're very focused on that we actually take some of the identities we have on ourselves and take them off. Well, if you do, so thank you, Michael. Um, if you don't start to disrobe from some of the identities or mindsets or ways of being, you'll just carry them all along with you. And that becomes a lot of emotional baggage. <laughs> so let me use a specific example because this could sound very abstract to someone. Um, I started Joie de Vivre uh, Hotels when I was 26, ran it for 24 years, sold it. It's now a Hyatt brand. Two years later, I, I joined Airbnb, but not as the CEO. I'd been founder and CEO of my own company for 24 years. I was asked to join to be the in-house mentor to Brian Chesky, the CEO of Airbnb, but also be the head of global hospitality and strategy. So one of the name tags or identities that I needed to take off was the idea of being a CEO. And for some, for many people, that would have been very hard. If you've been from age 26 to 50, CEO of your own company, and now you're joining a little tech startup and you're not, you know, and you're mentoring someone 21 years younger than you, but he's also your boss. <laughs> That required me to take off some identities. I'm not. I'm no longer the boss. I'm no longer the CEO. Um, I'm no longer the person who's the know-it-all in the company. I'm going to be the curious one. So I, I, one of the things that I think people need to do in midlife, and I, I define midlife as 35 to 75, so it's a very long period, is we need to learn how to say, what is it that's no longer serving me? A mindset, an identity, a role that I need to just say, I'm ready to let go of that. And the exercise you're referring to is you write them, uh, you know, in our case here at the Modern Elder Academy, you put them on like name tags and then you, you light them on fire and just, just don't do like I did in my video, <laughs> which is to almost light my pants on fire because like <laughs> these were stickers I was taking off and lighting on fire and the, the sticker while it was on fire stuck to my finger. I couldn't get it off my finger. And then it fell off my finger onto my lap. So that was embarrassing. Uh, but we, you know, so long story short is in order to be fresh and a beginner and try new things, you have to put some things to rest. And that is all I'm, that is what our exercise is all about. We call it the great midlife edit. Yeah, and it's interesting in connection with that. Also, you talk about the heaviness uh, curve, the U curve. And uh, I got a bit of an awakening there because apparently I'm in, in the entering the worst phase of my, <laughs> my life. So what you're saying is you, you start very happy in the beginning of your life and then you go down in the bottom of your curve and that's entering your, your mid 40s and up to your, your 50s. And, and then, then it's challenging. What, what is your thinking around that and actually putting that matches out there? Because that could either make many people like, wow, 
that's not good news or what 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 is what is the idea around that well as they say in advertising for car commercials your mileage may vary um so uh, don't take the social science research as you know um just a religion it's 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 just an indicator and what the indicator shows across all cultures is that from about age 22 to 25 till about age 45 there's a slow decline in your life in people's life satisfaction there's a lot of reasons for this we can explore it if you want to but it's it maybe may go too psychological for our listeners if, if uh, so I'll just say around 45 to 50 people hit bottom um we have heard that described as the midlife crisis i don't think of it so much as a crisis i feel like it's really a calling it's that opportunity to say what am i doing with my life and and where do i want to take it but what the social science research shows that's interesting is that in people's 50s you're happier than your 40s 60s happier than 50s 70s happier than 60s pretty consistently across cultures so to answer your question i think actually helping people understand that if they're going through something in their 40s especially in their second half of their 40s it's natural and normal um it's not to say oh no look forward to it and you know imagine the worst no it's more like if you are having a difficult time this is not unusual and here are the reasons why it's a mashup of a variety of things and you can look forward to it getting better because the society narrative on aging is almost as if from age 25 on it just gets worse and worse and worse um and in fact the the social science research shows quite the opposite so the societal narrative on aging is different than our personal narrative and um what i'm what i'm trying to help people see is uh that gives some encouragement that after 50 things get better yeah, but it's also very interesting because you talk a lot about meaning as well meaning in life and we have a a shared book uh, man search for meaning i read about 10 years ago when i had a, a really difficult time i had a mentor to put that in my hand and said read that and you will get a different perspective on things and at the same time you uh, you've been also in in time where you have uh, been in transition written uh, emotional equations uh, and and where you actually try to take may maybe very you know complex and heavy psychology down to equations and i want to stop a bit about meaning and the reason why i want to talk about meaning is that in these times we live in now we're going through a pandemic 2021 is probably a transformational year for many people loss of job whatever change of career uh you know death uh, very very big big subjects going on some of the most stressful sometimes in people's life so, and what what is your your view on this because you talk about despair and meaning in life it's very important to understand that equation Yeah, let's let's talk about that specific equation because that's this is the equation that led me to writing that book emotional equations. So, if you take Viktor Frankl's famous book Man's Search for Meaning, which is the story of his, his his experience as a psychologist in a concentration camp in World War II, what you could do is dis distill it down to the following equation: despair equals suffering minus meaning. And if you if you have any if you have any interest in Buddhist philosophy it it is that suffering is ever present that's the first tenet or rule of buddhism um and so if suffer if suffering is the constant then what the equation tells you is despair and meaning are inversely proportional the more meaning you feel in your life the less despair you feel and once you realize that you realize that meaning is a fuel meaning whether you're in a concentration camp or you're in the prison of your own mind when you can actually find meaning uh and I'll come back to that word in a moment. If you can find meaning in something, it actually gives you a sense that you're learning something. So meaning could be wisdom, learning, lesson, um anything that gives you some sense of hope that the thing that you're going through right now is going to actually not just make you stronger. You know, they, there's there's clichés like what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What you know, and I'm not suggesting that this is all about just how to be strong and grit your way through it although there's something to be said for doing that but it's also it makes you smarter it makes you wiser it gives you life experience that actually will serve you later in life and it's something you can share with others and when you start to realize that man what I'm going through right now in this pandemic as a hospitality uh, professional is the kind of thing that's going to serve me 
the rest of my life because I'm learning lessons that are, are going to be probably the most profound lessons I will ever learn in my business life. That's one way to s- dealing with the despair that what you could be feeling given how bad the last year has been for our industry. Yeah, and and it's interesting uh, when you talk about here in the book as well. There's also that it's these scars, as you says, to take us on, and and you come in on that in in your, one of your your latest book. Uh, it's called uh, Wisdom, uh, where you talk about your experiences at Airbnb, where you said in the beginning that your role have totally changed from when you come in. You had to take that sticker of CEO off, but. But before we go in to talk a bit more about Airbnb and your career and what you've done, I also want to touch on another word uh, you talk a lot about and I see across your thing is joy. And funny enough, uh, Joy of Life was the company name of your hotel chain as well. If I Joie de vivre, the French. Joie de vivre. Uh, yeah. uh-huh. yeah. um, so so what, what does that word mean for you and why it's so important? And it's almost following your true life and all your books. You know, it's interesting, Michael. I mean, there are very few companies in the world where the name of the company is also the mission statement of the company. So our mission statement was to create opportunities to celebrate the joy of life, especially for our employees and our customers. Um, And so to have a name, Joie de Vivre, that was also the mission statement meant that anybody interacting with us knew what we were all about. So I loved that. On the other hand, Joie de Vivre as a name in America The United States is not particularly fluent in French. And so people didn't know how to spell it, how to pronounce it, nor what it meant. Did they know what it meant? So there was a, it did take some time for people to understand it. But I, I believe joy is an important emotion, as is happiness, but they're, they're different emotions. I went to Bhutan to study the Gross National Happiness Index because they're the ones who started that. Um, and I gave a TED talk on, on that subject. But joy is different than happiness. Happiness is often circumstantial, whereas joy is comes from within you. And so, it, in fact, uh, the author of the book Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger, said, happiness is a solid and joy is a liquid. And what he meant by that is happiness is usually sometimes circumstantial and based upon things, tangible things. And joy is not... Is a is not a solid. It's a liquid. It means it's sort of something that bubbles up from within within you, which is why we say I was overflowing with joy. You don't say you're overflowing with happiness, and and so that I feel like joy in many ways is a more profound emotion than happiness because it's coming from inside. Yeah, and I think that was a really great way of explaining. I never thought about the happiness and joy thing, and exactly, it resonates really well. If it, the reason why I wanted to start talking about these three words because I think in a way when uh, I love to study uh, people and the best of the best what they're doing I think they simply uh, give a simple of who you are and how you approach business and uh, I can see when uh, I dived into it in the previous conversation we had was like business and psychology is a very big part of it and uh, when I looked a bit where you started and maybe you can just give the the audience a bit of maybe a bit of a, a journey here and, and why you did the choice you did. You started in commercial real estate, uh, a very different thing than uh, hospitality. Uh, wh- why did you choose that and go on into hospitality? Sure. So I um, I went to Stanford University as an undergrad uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And then I went straight into Stanford Business School to get my MBA. Um, I was focused on real estate. So uh, my my uncle was a successful real estate uh, developer and broker in California. And he took me under his wing and mentored me. So when I graduated from Stanford Business School at age 23, I decided to go work for a real estate developer in San Francisco. It was a bit of a maverick. It It was definitely a maverick real estate developer, but they weren't doing hotels. They were doing other kinds of real estate, um, mostly office buildings and showrooms and things like that. And so I went to work for them to understand what does it mean to be a real estate entrepreneur and developer. Little did I know that at between age 23 when I joined and age 25, I started to become aware in San Francisco of a trend in hospitality, which was boutique hotels. Now, in Europe, boutique hotels have been around forever. But in the United States, it's a relatively new phenomenon. It's only 40 years old, basically, from the early 1980s. And so as I studied boutique hotels, and I saw that San Francisco and New York were the two places they were really 
starting to bubble up, um, I went to the president and the CEO of our company and I said, hey, I want to create a hotel division. And I came to him at age 25 with no hotel experience saying that to him. And he looked at me like, are you crazy? You don't know a thing about hotels. And I said, well, I, I want to learn everything. And he said, no, you know, you, you've got a job and keep focusing on what you're doing. And that's when I decided I'd start my own company. And I didn't, yes, I did not have any hotel background at all. Did not go to Cornell, Cornell Hotel School or Lausanne or anywhere like that. But I did know something about how to renovate and develop buildings. And, you know, so I bought a broken down motel in a bad neighborhood in San Francisco and renamed that hotel the Phoenix. And it became the famous rock and roll hotel for San Francisco. And um, so at age 26, I was a hotelier and a CEO and frankly, one of the early boutique hoteliers in the United States. And then you went on a really explosive journey over 20 years, growing it from, from one hotel to, to plus 50 uh, hotels. Can you tell a bit about what does that do with you as an individual when you go on a journey like that as a CEO, because that that has must been you know been really accelerated the last ten year of that journey. I could imagine. Yeah, you know it's interesting. Um, I when I start when I created that first hotel, the Phoenix, I wasn't sure if this was going to become a big company or, or not. I just wanted to test out my theory of what I think a boutique hotel should be like. Um, and as it turns out, it was successful and. You know, three and a half years after that first hotel, um, I created the second and then the third, uh, back to back to back. What I really needed to learn was I couldn't do it all. <laughs> For the first hotel, it was only 44 rooms and I had my hand in everything. Um, but as we grew, I realized the most important thing I needed to do as a leader was uh, create a culture that was a magnet for great people um, and that actually helped create great experiences. Um, I also needed to surround myself with people who were specialists in areas, you know, that I didn't know much about, like, uh, you know, hiring the, our head of operations who understood hotel operations better than me was important. Hiring a revenue manager who understand, understood the yield management of pricing. Um, so these were the kinds of things I needed to do. I also needed to make sure that that leadership team felt like a unified team. Um, so a lot of the early early lessons I had were around culture and leadership. And that's why I've, I'm fascinated with psychology. Uh, and I've uh, all five of my books have had something to do with psychology and business. Because I think, uh, as you said earlier, the most neglected fact in business is that we're all human. And uh, humans don't show up on a, a balance sheet or on a P&L. Um, or often not in a strategic plan, uh, but they are the fundamental that makes the difference between two companies is the quality of the humans in that company and how engaged and successful they are. Could you tell the audience a bit about how do you actually how do you actually create that environment for a success or peak performance, as you mentioned in your book, Peak? Uh, because I think there's many companies as they grow that that's the that's maybe not what they talk about. They talk about some more functional things that's not working, finance or marketing in their business. But it comes down, and we really peel off the onion. It comes down to the human factor. What it was it that you did? What was the recipe? Well, I would say if, if someone wants to really understand the recipe in a lot of detail, um, my book Peak: How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow is the re is the book to read of my five books. Because it's the fundamental philosophy of business and leadership that I have, which is based upon Abraham Maslow's uh, iconic psychology theory called the hierarchy of needs. And, and what he said, you know, 60 years ago, uh, more than 60 years ago, is that people have some fundamental basic needs and then they have higher needs. Those basic needs need to get met partially before you can move up to the higher needs. So what I believe is that there's a, there's a there's an actual pyramid for employees, for customers, and for investors. And I'll just be brief on the employee pyramid, and I won't go any further unless you want me to. Um, the employee pyramid is money at the base of the pyramid, recognition at the middle, and meaning at the top. And they, those translate to a job at the bottom of the pyramid, a career in the middle, and then a, a calling at the top, or you know, uh, also survival at the bottom, succeed in the middle, transform at the top. 
when you know that that survival, succeed, transform paradigm is the paradigm that influences whether an employee is loyal, whether they're engaged, whether they're self-actualizing, then what you realize is that, yes, the compensation package is really important, but, it, but most hospitality employers think that's the primary reason that someone comes to work. And yes, it's a fundamental need, but the differentiator between one hotelier and another is not how much they're paying their people. It's how much recognition and meaning those employees feel. And so I talk about quite a bit in that book about how do you create a culture of recognition and meaning. And um, I, unlike a consultant who might write a book, I, <laughs> I, I do it based upon my experience as a CEO. And so, um, so I guess that to summarize, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that what's easiest to measure in most companies is what's at the base of the pyramid because it's tangible. But what's most valuable in life and, in, and for employees is, at the, is what's intangible, uh, which is at the top of the pyramid. And so addressing those recognition and meaning needs of our employees is what differentiates you as an employer. Yeah, one of the things I got when I read your book, uh, Peak, actually the first time about 10 years ago, uh, where I got the book from a friend of mine that said, uh, you like Danny Meyer, you should read this as well. And you can put that together with good to great. And he was absolutely <laughs> right. Because what I got was suddenly a framework. And I think a lot of uh, leaders or CEOs, what we often need is, is the, the framework of how we actually can measure that we're doing progress. And sometimes just having some words we could put on instead and actually show other people how do we actually get to there. So I don't know if that was your meaning by writing the book as well, to give that framework a way to actually inspire people to create better businesses. Michael, thank you. I really appreciate the homework you've done on this as well as the insight you have because that's exactly correct. One of the things, we, we used the peak model in Joie de Vivre. It helped us during the dot-com bust and 9-11 to triple in size when many of our competitors went bankrupt or their hotels went into foreclosure. So what I wanted to do was to be able to articulate it internally and say, you know, here's what we've been using. And then what I kept hearing from people who joined the company during that time is, wow, you have put in writing and in diagrams, in, in visual symbols, what I've always believed in business, but I didn't have a language for it. And that's the number one thing I've heard when the book came out. So why, you know, why would a CEO share his secrets, his or her secrets uh, about leadership and about, you know, running a company? Because my basic belief is uh, I'm, a, I'm a karmic capitalist. So a karmic capitalist believes that what goes around comes around. And so if I am going to be serving others and actually giving away wisdom, it will come back to me in all kinds of ways. And I've found that to be the case in my life. So... Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to help, and I also wanted to help not just the hospitality industry, but I, the the principles of Peak are universal. It, they can go across cultures, industries, etc. And so, and that's what we found. The, the book has had a, got a huge international audience um, from all kinds of industries. And then uh, it sounds like uh, you know a fairy tale that uh, growing that business, uh, you took it through two difficult recessions as well two difficult times in history as well. And then uh, you decided to sell. Um, what was that that triggered that uh, as the CEO founder of a life work? Yeah, let me talk, let's talk about dying. <laughs> so you, you mentioned at the start that I died nine times, which is true, but it was within 90 minutes. So I, I didn't, I, I'm not the cat who had nine lives uh, in the sense of I died multiple times over the course of many years. No, no, no. I had one experience. I was on a, an antibiotic because I had a broken leg, broken ankle and a bacterial infection in my in leg. And I ended up being allergic to the antibiotic I was on. And so after I gave a speech on stage on crutches, I sat to sign books and that's when I slumped in my chair and I went unconscious first. And then when the paramedics showed up, I actually went flatline the first time. And then I kept going flatline over the course of the next 90 minutes, both in the ambulance as well as in the emergency room. And so that experience at age 47, having at that point run my business for 22 years, um, was profound for me because I, I wasn't feeling, despair was suffering minus meaning. 
I didn't feel as much meaning in my job at that point as I had, you know, three years earlier, 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier. And so I could see that, man, we're in the, we're in the early stages of, this was the summer of 2008. We're in the early stages of the, the Great Recession. And I don't know if I am the best person to be leading this company anymore, but I can't run away. You know, I own the business. I, you know, we had 3,500 employees at that point and a lot of people were relying on me, but I did, I realized in the long term I did, didn't want to do this anymore. And that was a hard thing. That was another identity I had to let go of. Not, you know, I had to let go of that even before I joined Airbnb is the idea that, oh man, everybody knows Chip as the, the guy who's the founder and CEO of the largest hotelier in the San Francisco Bay Area in terms of the number of hotels we operated. And so, um, but it was easy to let go of it because when you actually die and go to the other side, you just sort of say, you know what, if I could, you know, if I'm, I'm alive again, I said the next day, but I could die at any time. Is this what I want to do the rest for the rest of my life? And the answer was no, I, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. And um, so I ended up selling the business. Uh, for way much, for so much less money than than I could have sold it for if I'd waited three or four more years, I, I didn't feel like I could wait three or four more years. But I sold just the management company and the brand. I didn't sell the real estate of the hotels, which was smart, you know, in retrospect because the hotel price is way way up over the next few years. So I still own nine hotels, but I've sold eleven of the hotels that I owned um, over the course of that time. Um, so yeah, so that's how I, and, and then I basically created a space to say, okay, what's next? Um, if I hadn't done that, Michael, if I hadn't said, okay, I'm no longer the CEO of that company, uh, the young founders of Airbnb who read my book peak and said, we want to be a peak company, interestingly enough, uh, they would never have reached out to me because if they said, you know, chips, the CEO of his own company, he can't come and join us. He's got a full-time job. Um, so that's, sometimes you have to actually stop something in order for something else to, to come into your life. A lot of times we don't do that because it's scary to stop something and then have an open field, not knowing what's next. Yeah. And I think it comes, uh, especially when you build a, a track record in, a, in a, in a career or an industry, because I had a couple of these conversations with people very qualified people have lost their job in hospitality reason where I said, well, it's not an end. It's a new beginning. I often say to him. So, so that situation that took you out on the journey, writing emotional equations we talked about before. And you went through uh, a period of time, probably where you didn't know what's going to happen, what you're going to be doing. And then Airbnb comes around, as you already mentioned and said, we, we, we need you to join. Why, why joining Airbnb, a tech business in principle, yeah, and I write about this in my book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. Um, it, what became clear to me was I, uh, in, there's a movie called uh, The Intern with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. And in that film, he, early on, he says, musicians don't retire. They quit when there's no more music left inside of them. Um, I knew I had music inside of me, uh, metaphorically. I just wasn't sure who to share it with. And so when Brian Chesky... Uh, reached out to me eight years ago and said, we have this little tech business that is growing really quickly and it's, a, it's going global, but none of us in the company, in our small company, have any background in hospitality or travel, uh, nor have we ever run a business before. Um, you have all those things and you're based here in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, would you join us? And would you be my mentor? And so I, I, I'll be honest, Michael, I did not understand what I was signing up for. <laughs> I thought I thought I was just supposed to be there and just sort of, you know, give them some wisdom about hospitality and travel. But when I joined, I realized, wow, I'm twice the age of the average person there. Uh, number two is Brian's my boss and he's 21 years younger than me, but I'm also mentoring him. That's an unusual relationship. That could be an awkward relationship. And so for the first five uh, months that I was there, we did not tell the press. We kept it quiet because we weren't sure if it was going to work well. Um, and, and then we knew it was working well, and then we opened it up to everybody and people knew about it. And then it was a big deal because, frankly, the hotel industry and the travel industry had really not taken Airbnb seriously eight years ago. Um, it was like home sharing. Like, why would anybody want to stay in someone else's home? 
I mean, I, I just heard it over again. And, and I sort of felt it too, because I, I didn't really understand the business model. Um, I did, you know, I knew that they, on the vacation rental side with VRBO, I knew that there was a, they competed with that company. That's about all I knew. Um, I didn't realize how big Airbnb was in urban markets, you know, as a disruptor, and then also having to deal with regulations or a lack of regulations of the business that they were in. So it was hard. I'd never worked at age 52 in a tech company before, so I had to learn a whole new lingo. I had to be the dumbest person in the room uh, at times because I didn't understand you know, anything about tech. But it also gave me the opportunity to be as curious as I was wise. And that's why they started calling me the modern elder. They said, a modern elder is as curious as they are wise. And that's what I said. You know what? I am that. I will be curious and wise at the same time. So, you know, I'll just need to know when do I up the ante on one versus the other. And um, yeah, it worked really well. For four years, I was in a full-time role overseeing much of the business and its growth um, and working very closely with the founders. And luckily, the founders were, were great to work with. I would not have joined if I didn't have a ton of uh, respect for and confidence in Brian as the CEO. Uh, and there's a great leadership team that we put together. and that you know, helped Airbnb grow to what it is today. And I, the, I've not been in an operating role for four years now. I've just been a strategic advisor. But it has been a, quite a journey these past eight years. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. And, and people have a, a very different you know, okay, respect for, for Airbnb and uh, what it means in, in the travel industry today. So um, you talked about the modern elder. So you were named that in Airbnb. Is that a thing you think sometimes in, in business and in organization, actually, we forget a bit when people age and they might not be the CEO or the executive. They are maybe not looked at as valuable as they were before and they don't can contribute in the same level? Yeah, I think you know, here, there's a few interesting facts, Michael. So first of all, we're living longer on average. Uh, power in a digital society is moving younger in terms of you look at the age of the CEOs of companies going public today versus 20 years ago. And the world is changing faster. So living longer, power moving younger, world changing faster. That means a lot of people in midlife um, are sometimes confused and bewildered by the world that they're in. Additionally, uh, and this is statistics from the United States, and I'm not sure if it's the same in Europe and elsewhere, but 40% of Americans have a boss younger than them. And by the year 2025, the majority of Americans will have a boss that's younger than them. We've never seen anything like that before. Because historically, it was the older people who had the power in the hierarchy. And you had to pay your dues to you know, be a young person doing all the work to grow into being the older person who tells people what to do. Well, that model is not as true. It's not so true in many industries today, um, including hospitality is moving in the direction of uh, you know a, a new breed of younger people, much more savvy about tech and how you fuse tech and travel. Um, so, long story short, is I do think that there are a you know a growing number of older people. Let's say. 45 and older. <laughs> um, 45 used to be young age, but it's, you know, in some industries, it's, it's an old age. But if you're 45 years old, so, so Michael, you're 45? How old are you? Uh, uh, 42. So 42. Heading there. So 42 years old. The, the truth is that if you live till, I don't know, how long do you think you'll live? Give, give me 95. I told my son because he asked me before Christmas, uh, I don't want you to die, Daddy. So, so how old are you going to be? And I said 120. <laughs> well, do you really think 120? Well, if you're going to live till 120, you, uh, you have you know, 78 years ahead of you, um, and, of adulthood ahead of you, and you only have, let's see, 24 years behind you. So you know, you're, you're, you're not even one quarter of the way through your adult life. And, and when you actually start doing the math on that, I did the math on this a couple of years ago when I was 58, and I said I was going to live till 98, and I realized, man, at 58 years old, I was only halfway through my adult life if I start counting at age 18. So I, 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 what I think people need to do is people in midlife have to start realizing, man, I'm going to have multiple lives, in, as in multiple careers and lives in my adulthood. 
and I am going to do what I call same seed, different soil. Take the mastery that you've learned, the wisdom you've learned, and then plant it in a new pot. And you sort of, in, in essence, repot yourself. And for me, I did that at Airbnb. I repotted myself from being CEO of a boutique hotel company to being the CEO whisperer, <laughs> the CEO whisperer helping a tech company with a hospitality focus become successful and or become more successful because they were successful when I joined. They were just small. And so I think that that is an interesting model is for us to say, how do we, how do we match young, brilliant entrepreneurs with older, experienced leaders who can actually learn from each other? I, I call this, I said I was a mentor. I was a mentor and an intern at the same time. And I think mutual mentorship, where the young are teaching the old, the old are teaching the young, depending upon the subject, and it's a reciprocal kind of arrangement, is, is the future of learning and development in most companies. Yeah, and it is super interesting just to put my uh, own weight in there as well, because my mentor, Chris Hughes, is uh, 73. He has a very great career, but he uh, is as young as me sometimes. And I think it's incredible the energy he comes to the table with. And he has so much you want to give. So I think, yeah, just out there, go and go and find those mentors or bring them into to your businesses. It, it, incredible things happen. They ask some really irritating questions. <laughs> make you reflect as the younger person in the room, especially about your your ethics and behaviors, which is always interesting. And and that, in a way, uh, planted the seeds, as I understand, to the Modern Elder Academy as well, because I guess you got that from that part in Airbnb and took that with you. To that, can you just tell the, the audience a bit about what what that is? We mentioned it; it's a roadmap to 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 manage that part of your life earlier. So what I what I saw for me was that I had no I had no guidebook or school or tools I could go to at age fifty two to understand how do I make sense of this era of my life uh, and be the modern elder in this company. And so after my four years of full time work at Airbnb. I, I moved down to Mexico, to Baja, California, an hour north of Cabo San Lucas. Um, and I um, decided that I wanted to write this book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. So I have a beach beachfront home. And one day I was going out for a run before I was going to start writing that day. And I had this epiphany. Um, and the epiphany was, why is it that we don't have schools? and tools for people in midlife to help them understand how to repurpose themselves and how to navigate the transitions of midlife. Um, and uh, so I decided to create the Modern Elder Academy, also known as MEA. And um, we opened three years ago and uh, have a campus right here on the beach and have had a thousand students come to either our one week or two week programs here in Mexico uh, from 24 countries and average age 54. So this is not elderly people. This is people who are elders. And, and quite frankly, you know, we've had people as young as 30 and as old as 88. So the, the theme that really is consistent throughout is how do we cultivate and harvest our wisdom um, and, and understand our mastery and then apply it out there in the world. And um, so, yeah, we've just, it's growing. We are now doing a series of locations in the United States. Um, because it's it's become so successful, and uh, so I, I, what I'm excited, you know, I'm lucky enough to have disrupted the hospitality industry twice as a boutique hotelier, and then with Airbnb as in home sharing, and I really want to do that again here. I the, the the disruption I see here is how do you take retirement communities, which I think are ready to be retired as a concept because they are, you know, it's all just a bunch of older people living together and. And, and not being very engaged with younger people, um, not being engaged with the land. Um, and how do you take retirement communities and turn them into regenerative communities? And so that's what we're, that's what we're doing is we're creating a series of regenerative communities with an MEA campus, a midlife wisdom school, um, a regenerative farm or ranch uh, on the property as well, and then a clubhouse and a, a set of residences to create the residential community part of it. And um, so I think, you know, we may have maybe creating something that becomes the model for 21st century 
communities uh, for people who are 45 and older, not just people who are 75 and older. And that's super interesting because the thing I wrote somewhere, or was it an interview I listened to, is that no, no, there's only going to be one of those. There's not going to be, because I think you were asked about, are you going to build a new hotel chain or a new I chain? think that was t- Tim Ferriss yeah, in my, a couple of years ago when I did a, a, a podcast with him. Yeah, I, 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 to be quite honest, Michael, I didn't, yeah, what, what the intention was not to start a new business and, and grow it. It was more to create something here in Baja in Mexico and say, man, this is so successful. Let's cattle, be a catalyst for people to go create it out in the world. But because it was so successful, people kept asking us, you've got to go do this in the United States. And so, um, yeah, it was hard for me to say no. And so we have a 2,600-acre ranch uh, in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where our first uh, U.S. location will be. Yeah, and I guess you put on the name tag again, CEO, or... Oh, you're just the founder. Yeah, no, I'm, that's, I'm, and that's I'm, interesting. You can pick them up again. You can, yeah. You can pick up a name tag now. If you've already burned it, you're gonna have to like start it over again and, and write it again. Um, but yeah, it's 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 been a great experience. In this, you know, incredible career, and actually, there's a, a couple other touch point people probably can find out. You uh, created a Everfest or a part of Ever Three Hundred as well so you've always been funding and launching things which is in korea and that's much more as you start studying the books but is there anything you would have liked to know today you're sitting after all these incredible milestones uh, in the beginning of your career wow i i think i would go back to the beginning of my career and say i i was there's certain things i think i got really early but there's some things i took a while for me and how do you capitalize a business you know, what's the best way to make sure you have enough money in the bank and how do you grow the business using capital is something I've only gotten better with with time. In the early days, I was not very good at that in terms of how to understand and size up investors. And so uh, because, you know, as as ethical and as high minded as you may be in operating a business, you know, cash flow is the lifeblood of a business. And if you are, you know, constantly in a capital constrained kind of way and dealing with the cyclicality, the cyclical nature of the hospitality business, um, it can it can really have a, a negative effect on the culture and on the company and on your own psychology um, if you don't have that well tended to. Who influenced you to learn these? Uh, I'll call it a CEO skill as well who, who has been most influential in your journey as a ceo founder on on your development and actually moved you through these transitions you need to go through i was lucky enough that there's a guy named herb kelleher who was the uh, founding ceo of southwest airlines i never met the man he's passed away now i never met him but when i was like 28 years old i reached out to him through and and talked with his secretary um, because I said I wanted him to be my mentor. And she laughed and she said, he doesn't have time to be your mentor, but if you write him a, a letter, uh, and ultimately I wrote him a letter once a year for 10 years with a bunch of questions about what it means to be a leader and what it means to create a culture in an organization, uh, I bet he'll answer you. And that's what happened. And over the next 10 years, he became my mentor from afar. Uh, and so a lot of the philosophy I have around leadership came from someone I never met. And that's super, that's super two interesting learnings there. Always ask also that Herb Keller is actually, he is the person that he is described to be the very human centered person because Southwest Airlines, if you look at the share price from good to great has been very stable over the years, probably more stable than General Electric. If you invested in them 20 years ago, it would have been a better investment than General Electric. And then it's such an interesting case study. That's probably for another conversation, but one of my favorite uh, companies to look at as well. What in that journey from starting back in real estate and to now to Modern Elder, what has been, you know, some of your, maybe your biggest failure and what did you learn from that? I think my biggest failure would uh, and uh, would have been Costa Nella, which was a upscale campground, a boutique campground that we started seven years before the word glamping ever, had ever been created. So we, it was way ahead of its time, but it really helped us to understand the evolving needs of the traveling public, uh, the desire to be closer to nature. 
and frankly, the desire for people to do yoga. And this was 1998. Um, and what it helped me to see is that when we were going to open our and launch our hotel Vitali in San Francisco, we decided to put a yoga studio on the penthouse level, which my investors in that hotel thought was just nutty, like a terrible idea. Like, why would anybody want to be doing yoga when they're doing a business trip? And, and I said, well, just trust me. We created this Costa Noa place. Every, we had horseback riding. We had mountain biking. We had hiking. We had yoga. The yoga was by far the most popular thing. And the people who were going to yoga were business people, especially business women. And, and so we created this new hotel, the Vitali, with a yoga studio on the top floor with a free yoga class every morning. And it just became a huge hit. So the failure of Costa Noa helped seed the success of Hotel Vitali. And I think that that's something that we should all learn from is that your failures can actually help create the fertilizer for your success on, in some other area. But also you didn't just create a yoga studio. You actually had a plan if it didn't work. I think that's quite significant if you think about it, if you approach it as a business person. That's right. We had a, um, the intent with my investors was that if this yoga studio doesn't work, um, then we'll turn it into a suite because it's on the, it was a beautiful, it, it was some of the best real estate in, in the building, great views, etc. But I said, listen, if it doesn't work, here's plan B. And that's an important thing for us all to consider is what's plan B. And I think uh, always have a always have a backup plan. That's really good advice. What about um, hospitality? We need to touch by that before we end the conversation. Where, where are we? Where does the industry stand? It feels like, you know, it's a, you know, moment in time and what's going to happen, you know, because people probably wanted to hear for a person like you, what do you think that's going to happen on, on, on maybe the bigger trends and what do we need to be aware of? So the bigger trends I would say are the following. Number one is as bad as the travel industry has been hit and it has been hit badly, um, there are some signs of growth and opportunity. Um, number one is uh, it's not that people aren't traveling anymore. In fact, we may have seen the, the dawn of a new era of the digital nomad going mainstream. Because if people actually can work remotely more often, then there's we've unleashed a whole collection of people who felt um, uh, tethered to an apartment or a home in where you know that was not far from the headquarters. Well, if many people can actually work remotely more easily that will mean that people will travel and they'll be traveling. They may live in a place like Baja here, which is just a two hour flight from Los Angeles and they live in Mexico, but they actually work in Los Angeles. And, but, but their company in Los Angeles allows them to come up twice a month for meetings. Um, but they live down here or it may mean someone actually is not, choosing to just live in Baja, but they're saying, I'm just going to be traveling around the world while I'm working. That's what a digital nomad does. So if digital nomads are now mainstream, wow, what opportunity does that create for the hospitality and travel industry? So I'd say that's a huge one. I'd say a second one that I'm betting big on because I am advising the CEO uh, as his mentor is um, co-work, uh, co-living, not co-working, co-working too, but co-living. The idea of how do you create places where people um, live together uh, and uh, have usually small, small residences, small uh, apartments or small homes, and you take advantage of a lot of social and collective um, services that are provided. Well, there's a company called The Collective based in London, uh, and I am deeply involved in that company because they are poised to become the world's leading co-living developer and operator. Because I think co-living co -living is sort of like the digital nomad trend. People actually living in smaller places and then traveling some and, and maybe the collective is going to have locations in lots of different places and in Berlin and in New York and Miami and Chicago and uh, all over the you know UK, and so there's an element of like, okay, wow, if I could actually be a member of that place, have a primary place, but I'll be on the road a lot, well, that and and live in other collective buildings, that sounds interesting. So I think that's a trend line. 
But I would just say the bigger key thing that I think leaders need to be considering right now, whether you're a travel industry leader or just a leader in general, is um, double down on your evangelists. There, if, if you have not created evangelists in your business, people who are your most loyal customers, who love you no matter what, um, then something went wrong before this downturn. Um, and you better now start learning how do you create evangelists because evangelists will stick with you in good times and bad times. They will be your best marketing engine, your best marketing spend because you don't have to spend money on evangelists like you do on you know, Facebook ads. Um, and I found over and over again, both at Chihuahua Vive, at Airbnb, and now at the Modern Elder Academy, is if you really invest in those relationships with your core customers and try to understand, as I talk about in the book Peak, their unrecognized needs. Uh, in the case of that Hotel Vitali, the unrecognized need was there were people who wanted to do yoga in their hotel, um, but nobody had ever asked them, do you want to do yoga in your hotel? But because it just seemed like it didn't make sense in, in, for a business class hotel in a financial district. When you actually understand your customers, maybe even better than they understand themselves, um, you have built a customer for life. Yeah, and if people want to learn a bit more about how you think marketing, you also had a book about that, Marketing the Matters. Marketing actually, it's matters. all about that relationship with the customer, which I think it's so key that you actually know who are the who are the the evangelists that, that will carry you through anything. What about uh, some some people will probably sit out there and think about you know, Larry had a question here, and he his thinking was a bit like, okay, we have this the old school hospitality that's woken up now. And uh, Larry Corman is the, the CEO or president of AKA Residencies. And uh, he said, like, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to transform? How are we going to be the new chip? How are we going to find those new chips we want to get into our company, he said. And what is it that we need to do? What is it that we need to be aware of? Because uh, he, he might see that the old business model is a bit on the track. He needs to come to the Modern Elder Academy. <laughs> um, I mean, I... I, I I, I really do think that it, it it's about helping people, or, or at minimum, read my book, Wisdom at Work. I do think it's about helping people to realize that they have more to offer than they know. Um, and how do you create more intergenerational collaboration? So this is not just about how do we help old people keep their jobs um, and keep their power. It's about actually how do we recognize that there's a, a changing of the guard and there's a younger a uh, collection of Gen Xers and Millennials and Gen Z that have a whole new perspective, especially around technology, that can be exceptionally important to the travel industry. And I think if we can create the kind of environment where every every generation is represented at the table uh, as leaders in a company, uh, that kind of company is going to be more successful. Great. So, uh, Larry, there's a, a book for you there and a little trip to uh, to Mexico. And uh, another another friend of mine and a big hospitality guy, a young guy, Will Slick, has run his own podcast as well. He said, Michael, I really want uh, to understand from Chip. Chip is a, is a great uh, hero of mine, what he thinks the next generation of hospitality professionals should uh, should be aware of and what they should do as they go into hospitality. I mean, I think... Uh... I would just say it's a combination of algorithm and people wisdom, algorithm and people wisdom. So it's like, how do you apply technology to this industry in a way that helps this industry, which is tends to be very slow moving in technology? Uh, how do we help to integrate algorithms and technology into the industry, but never forget the people wisdom, which basically means what does it mean to serve people? What does it mean to be in the hospitality business? Um, and so I would say, the key thing there is just it's a combination of the soft skills of understanding people with the technology skills of, you know, how do you use technology to create a better experience? Great, great advice. Uh, and I totally agree. We have probably been as a hospitality in the dark age when it comes to adapting technology and the way of working like technology companies, again, with a totally different conversation and relates a lot to your thinking in uh, in the, the book Peak. In the end of the, uh, the podcast conversation, Chip, we always ask the guest, what is the top three advice you want to give to, to leaders, founders, CEOs out there in the, the hospitality industry and above as well in, in these times? What, what, what should they do? So if I had three pieces of advice for leaders in 2021, given the pandemic and everything else, and 
this is true for hospitality leaders or leaders in general. It would be uh, number one, leaders are the emotional thermostats of those they lead, uh, which basically means be cautious about showing anger, anxiety, or any kind of um, negative emotion that could be contagious in your organization. Uh, so that'd be one. Number two is um, build your leadership team. This is the time where alignment on leadership team is more important than ever. And don't think that that's just about keeping track of are we on path uh, and you know how, how are we doing with our critical path and our KPIs, our key performance indicators. A lot of it has to do with making sure that you are there emotionally for your team and that your team feels like a a well-oiled machine, but also like a bunch of humans who are open to being vulnerable with each other. Uh, so sometimes that could mean starting a team meeting with each person just doing a personal update of how things are going in their life beyond work. Um, sometimes it could mean having one of your leadership team members say, okay, here's the question for today's meeting. Um, what's the biggest failure you've had in your life and what did you learn from it? So just helping people to move out of just the mechanical, okay, we're going to get through it, survival mode, helps people to build a bond and trust. Um, and then thirdly, you know, know how to you know, recharge yourself. This is a, we're in a marathon, not a sprint here. And so um, make sure you know what it is that actually refuels yourself, whether it's wellness practices, mindfulness, um, exercise, uh, uh, more sleep, um, t taking a three day vacation, you know, every quarter so that you just are like offline for three days, uh, for that three, for that three days, because we live in an era where we're online every day and to be able to have three days off, uh, is a, a way to refuel yourself. Yeah. And I, I think, I think that's super interesting. So just to, 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 to caveat your three, three, uh, advice, what is it that you do as a, a very business, busy business leader? Exactly to recharge yourself besides taking three days off the social media and, and the Zoom calls, which can be exhausting. What is it like your your life pillars are? I, I meditate every morning. Um, that's a basic practice. I, I um, turn myself upside down on an inversion machine. So I'm hanging upside down every morning for about 10 minutes as well. Um, I write in the morning, which is a way of, to sort of You know, uh, I, I, I enjoy writing, so writing is an easy thing for me to do. Um, I get massages twice a, twice a week right now. That's not always the case, but right now I'm getting twice a week and loving that. So, um, yeah, those are some of the things I do right now. What, what is it that writing does for you? Because I think that's interesting. I had a couple of other people say that writing does something for them. Well, there's two sides to it. One is it can be a journal. I mean, if you have a journal... That can be helpful. I, I have something called my wisdom book, which is just like the lessons I'm learning along the way. But also I love writing and I write, a, I have a daily uh, blog called Wisdom Well. It's on the Modern Elder Academy website. And being able to write and be expressive, you know, I think being able to express yourself beyond just the linear brain um, is part of the value of, for me, writing. But it could be playing music, um, listening to music, dancing, um, you know, riding uh, a mountain bike, surfing. There are lots of ways to get out of your head. And I think getting out of your head is a good thing right now. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, Chip, for all your, you know, your insights, advice. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that's really going to find these useful in these times. If people want to know more, Chip, where do they go? Where do, what is the best platform to... to uh, learn more about the uh, Modern Eldery Academy, more about you, etc. cetera. Yeah. So Modern Elder Academy uh, is just modernelderacademy.com. And that's where you'll find the Wisdom Well blog as well. Um, the Wisdom Well blog is usually on my social media. Um, the, the Probably the one that's most active is LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn profile is where you can see a lot of my articles. Um, and then there's a chipconley.com website. And that tells you just more about me. 
Great, great. Thank you so much. Power, energy, and uh, love to to you and uh, the team around you and everything you're involved in. And uh, hopefully we'll soon be on the other side of this journey. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for what you do, too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Chip, for sharing your story, insights, and wisdom on how to grow yourself and your organization. If you want to get more insights on how to grow yourself and your organization, please visit episode 87 with Deepak Ori, who is the CEO of Libora Hotels and Resorts on Emotional Touch Points. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights and strategies and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. You can check them out at bizsimply.com or on their socials, Biz Simply or Biz Simply HQ, and you can also email them directly on advice at bizsimply.com. A big thank you to Pina Charlson also, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Thanks for listening and be maverick.